ahead. What you everybody ready? Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're recording. Okay. So well, thanks uh, to everyone uh, for um, attending this session. So in this session, we will be talking about some of the marketing um, aspects. And uh, first, we're gonna um, uh, uh, talk. Uh, I mean, let. Um, our sponsors introduce themselves. So we have uh, first uh, Jeff uh, Sommer from uh, Local Labels, um, which is a, quite of an in innovative uh, labeling company. So uh, we're very excited to have them. And uh, so please, um, please, Jeff, take it away. Great. Th thank you for the introduction, Feli. So, um... My name is Jeff Summer. I'm here with Lorpon Labels with my colleague Celine, who's also on this call. So uh, Lorpon has, uh, has, you know, we're in the pressure sensitive labeling space. Um, about five years ago, we made some major investments into digital printing and um, embellishment effects that really work well in the wine industry. So right now we're offering um, HP Indigo digital offset printing technology for, for our wine labels. We have two HP uh, presses, as well as three Flexo presses um, that are used sometimes for wine, depending on, on the quantity and the specific job we're looking at. We also have three uh, digital embellishment presses. So that's for adding decorative effects to, um, to any of the labels. So some of the some of the other major investments that we've made in the last little while are 100% video inspection of all our um, labels that's going to be launching this summer. So that's going to be like an, an AI that's actually visually looking at every single label for any print defects um, and uh, to monitor quality. And, and we have some more investments on the way in 2021 and 2022 with regards to digital printing and embellishments. Um, also, this year, we launched our online portal. So that's for our clients to log in and see their artwork, see their labels. You can see your order status, track history, invoices, basically all of your information is online in one place. Um, artwork approvals will also be done on this kind of central portal um, for all of your staff. So if you have an artwork approver or a design agency that also needs to kind of sign off on your labels, that's available for them as well. So some of the, some of the common things that we work on in the wine industry is working um, with you know, this is a marketing talk, so it's great because we often work with marketing people and owners and designers and um, brand specialists on, you know, doing a rebrand for a winery, looking at different materials, you know, it can range from something that is going to be subtle, classy with timeless materials, um, or something that's, you know, a little bit splashy with bold, colorful materials, tactile effects, you know, things like black papers, um, we're even doing labels on different suede-like materials that have like a velvet touch. Wood veneer is something that we've worked on in the past. And uh, one of the things that Duarte and I were talking about earlier is, you know, for sparkling wine or ice wine that's going to be in bucket. Um, we have on many of our materials um, an Aqua Shield kind of premium wet strength upgrade to what would be considered the normal kind of industry standard um, wet strength available. So. Again, the print techniques that we use, digital offset printing, uh, flexo printing, screen printing as well, we can do. Um, some of the embellishments, we, uh, we have foil stamping, obviously, for metallics, golds and silvers, metallic different colors, purples, greens, basically whatever color you need. Holographic effects are achievable. Um, embossing and debossing. And we're actually seeing some a lot more debossing over the last year or so. And it's it's a little bit of a subtle effect. And it's in my opinion, anyways, it's really it's a really nice look. Um, screen printing, which involves doing like tactile and high build effects, gloss varnishes, um, metallic inks with with very high opacity. So all of this is really designed to engage with your audience and your consumer. You know, we also with the digital printing have variable content, which includes versioning, numbering, so limited edition um, runs. You can actually number the bottles and number the labels. And then unique um, randomized effects. We have some unique technology um, with HP called uh, Mosaic and Collage. And they can work really well for like a fun, you know, summer white wine or, or like a campaign that's being done. Um, it wouldn't be something that you would probably do on an everyday basis, but it, it, can, be a nice, it can be a nice effect. And then we can also work with um, and recommend different uh, vendors for augmented reality type of labels. So that's, you know, what you would see you know, with a smartphone or something like that, where the label actually comes to life on the screen. 
So really our whole messaging is to, is to work with you and your branding and, and your agencies and creatives and come up with the best solution that helps engage with your audience and drive more sales and have your bottles stand out on the retail shelf. And, and, you know, we work in a consultative way and approach and, and, um, you know, we're looking to grow our business in Prince Edward County. And it's a place that myself and some of our staff also vacation and, and, uh, you know, we, we'd obviously like to work with, you know, as many of you as possible. So thanks very much. Um, thank you, um, Jeff. I have a few yep. a couple of questions here uh, from sure. the audience. So uh, do you have any example of your uh, debossing? Like, do you have any labels right now with you? Or can yeah, you so we, um, I don't have, like, I don't have any, and if, if we could, I don't know if we can share a video on here. We have one on our YouTube page of, um, um, we've recently cool. done, Debossing, it tends to not show up as well in photos or videos, um, but we okay. did some work with a, a winery on Vancouver Island called Avril Creek, and there's some debossing okay. there. So if there's a way, yeah. is there a way for us to post a, a yeah, photo you can post, or video? Yeah, post you can the link post into the in chat. Your, um, in, okay. in the chat, or you can also post, uh, you have a, a booth, right? Yeah, we do. So is it in your booth or...? Do you have a picture um, that Celine Celine might show? have to I don't know if she's still on this call but yeah Celine might have to comment on on that I know she can add it or, um, she's added she's added all of our stuff there right now so okay okay or uh, we, we, and you also have the meetup right we can like we can probably yeah. discuss also a little bit about that a little bit more yeah um would that work for for you Nancy Okay. Uh, uh, there's another question, like, uh, uh, are you seeing any demand for QR codes on labels at this stage? We, or... we do a little bit, like, you know, we see it across different industries. I'll be honest, like, I think QR is something that people talk about and sounds really good, but we yeah. haven't seen that many amazing executions of it. And I think in the past, yeah. it's been because you needed special software on a smartphone to be able, you'd have to see the QR code, bring up the software, and then use it with mm -hmm. kind of some of the inbuilt um technology now when you go to take a photo it shows up on an iphone at least so yeah. yes we are seeing it but it's only as good like it's basically bringing you to a website or a portal right so um so is that related to that augmented reality because I, I, I was a no so uh, yeah so, so augment augmented reality basically is a again the reason why it's probably not seen more often is you have to have um, software uh, to yeah. do that and yeah. I think there's some good examples of it um, I forget the name there's there's we can post the the software that has some options for it and yeah. then there's somebody there's a there's somebody that we work with in Ontario that is doing it as well it's a pretty easy yeah. software and, and we would work with them and just recommend them to any wineries that we're working with um, mm -hmm. but basically you hold up your camera to the phone and it, yes. it doesn't need a QR code it's going to recognize the artwork on the container and yeah. from oh, just okay. from the printed label, it's going to pull up the it's going to pull up the, yeah. the augmented reality. That's amazing. <laughs> okay, next question <laughs> is uh, <laughs> uh, no I know you're going to be um, so. Um, what kind of um, environmentally friendly inks would you have yeah. like, uh, for your label? Okay, so that's a great that's a great question. So environmentally environmentally friendly materials. So we have a 100% PCW paper. So it's made from 100% post consumer waste. It yeah. is wet strength. It's a wet strength material. And the liner, it comes on a clear liner, clear polyester liner that is 100% post-consumer recycled content as well. So mm -hmm. it's probably one of the smallest um, environmental footprints of, of any mat wine material on the market right now. And that's and it is designed for, for beverage and ice bucket. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of environmentally friendly inks, so the digital print process we use for one, the press is a cart when it was built, it's a carbon neutral press. Um, the inks on it, um, we have a hundred percent recyclability of the, of any chemicals that go in it. So there is an, what's called an imaging oil. Basically it doesn't, it gets constantly reused in the press. So we're not throwing any of that stuff away. And the mm -hmm. small amount of waste we do have gets um, picked up from uh, an environmental company that actually cleans it and puts it back into, you know, and to make other products with it. So in terms of, you know, when I compare digital, our digital HP Indigo offset to Flexo or anything like that, there's really no comparison in terms of 
you know, what, if it, it being environmentally friendly. Also with the digital printing that we use, there's very little waste. Um, yeah. And that's always a factor that people don't talk about is, you know, how much ink yeah. is being wasted, how much is going down the yeah. drain, you know, that, that kind of stuff. There's no VOCs with it or anything like that as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, well, there's just a tiny question after that is how yep. much would a, a, a smaller, uh, I mean, a smallest run like uh, yeah. that's the uh, cost. It could be, it could be, it could be as it. little, yeah, it could be as little as a thousand labels. Typically our minimum okay. run for standard material that we have on our, on our floor is about $450. And there's no plate cost. There's no setup cost really for that. If you, um, you know, often wineries are doing like custom sizes. So if we don't have mm -hmm. the tool, there could be a one-time charge of anywhere from between 250 and $300 for the die, the cutting die. But, you know, and the, the minimum run depends on a bunch of things. It depends on the dimensions of the label, the material that's chosen. Um, yeah. It would typically range anywhere from a thousand to 2000 labels. And within that you could do multiple versions as well. So if you had like two versions that you wanted 500 each that we could do that. And we do that kind of stuff all the time. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. It's uh, okay. it's so interesting. <laughs> I mean, uh, I would like to direct anybody who has uh, further questions to your booth, definitely. And uh, thank you, Jeff. And thank you very so much. Gonna, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to head over. <laughs> thank to, you. Alex. Um, Head over to um, to Thierry from uh, Nuance um, uh, Winery Supplies, and uh, he will uh, present. This is more about winemaking and uh, some of the innovative uh, practices that they have over there. Okay. Hello, Thierry, ready? Yes. Yes. Can you okay. hear me? Uh, just a second. We're just switching over. I think. Yeah. Now we do have you. Hello. Okay, hello, hello everyone. Hello, Prince Edward County. Um, yeah, so um, we uh, are, so I'm Thierry Le Maire, uh, owner and founder of uh, Neon's Winery Supplies. Uh, we've been uh, operating since uh, 2013, uh, but the story, uh, my story in Canada, uh, I'm French by the way, uh, but the story in Canada started a long time ago in 96, 97. Uh, when I started to uh, promote the um, technique, the, at that time, new technique of micro-oxygenation. And I was uh, bringing that technique to uh, Canada, both in uh, Ontario and in uh, British Columbia, uh, through a company uh, called uh, Swentec. Uh, Alain Girard uh, used to run that. And in 2012, um, we decided to uh, kind of take over that, uh, that activity and um, and use all the, uh, the network and the, and the connections I had in France and Italy to um, try to bring interesting things to uh, to the Canadian wine industry. Um, starting, of course, with the things I knew the best, which were uh, um, aging um, aging technologies like uh, Macrox, uh, oak alternatives, uh, and uh, and specific tannins uh, but of course uh, very quickly we moved on uh, different things like uh, of course barrels we represent uh, radu and Hermitage barrels um, and uh, and some technologies some interesting technologies from uh, from Italy and France uh, so in 2015 we uh, introduced the uh, the technology of um, thermovinification flash detente uh, with uh, some of the big guys uh, in, in the area. Uh, a couple of years later, uh, we were the first ones to introduce the technology of uh, centrifuge decanter in uh, another big in, 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 uh, in Ontario. Uh, and uh, we decided to um, promote the, um, the, some of those technologies uh, for smaller wineries, because of course uh, in Canada we have a mix of uh, fairly large, medium size, and 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 fairly small wineries, and uh, everyone um, should access to should have access to all the, those uh, possibilities. Uh, and so we decided two years ago to invest in a small 
version of the thermal vinification flash detente, uh, which is something we offer as well as a service, uh, both in Ontario and in British Columbia, actually. Um, so I don't know um, if you want you want to know a little bit more about that, but uh, just so to summarize, so uh, our uh, offers uh, go from uh, wine making products, so yeast nutrients, uh, clarifiers, uh, stab stabilizer, etc., uh, to um, uh, bottles with uh, a specific uh, focus on uh, sparkling wine. Uh, sparkling wine, we do also um, tirage uh, crates, so we do uh, crown caps, uh, adjuvants, everything basically you need to, uh, to make uh, the, the best um, uh, sparkling wine possible. Uh, and in terms of equipment, uh, we do uh, yeast regeneration, flotation, um, all membranes technology, including uh, cross flow filtration, um, gas management um, and basically whatever whatever you need between grapes and and the bottle uh, at this point. Uh, maybe David, if you're yeah. around, you may want to add a few things. For sure, thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'll just add a few other things in. Uh, one mainly that uh, we are your Canadian source for DM corks as well. Um, so from sparkling through table wine, um, um, we will be able to help you with any of those needs. Um, just to quickly touch on the uh, flash detente um, program that we've had, we've seen um, really interesting results, successes through two very different vintages. Um, 2019 was a somewhat challenging cooler year, which we're all used to, but nonetheless very different from the rest of them. Um, and in that year, we were, uh, it was our first pilot with the mobile flash detente. So we were really trying to learn as much as we could on the smaller scale. And so we were um, trying uh, large, large batch percentages of, of flash detente versus partial, uh, partial amounts that were mixed with fresh grapes um, to see the overall results. And um, all the way through the, uh, the range, the results were very interesting. Um, just some of the quickly, just to sum up some of the things that we're looking to do with, with the equipment. Um, there's a bit of a stigma that it's, it's only for big commercial producing uh, wineries or um, for only working with uh, high yield crops or, or, uh, or grapes. In fact, that's not the case. Um, so we, um, in 2019, we were able to, uh, again, do a nice healthy trial and, and show, for example, grapes that um, did have virus, uh, they were virus infected and had almost no color um, coming out of the skins and we were able to make red wine with them. Um, we have lots of, lots of interesting results on that front. Uh, the equipment does remove pyrazines and um, we've, we've, we've done some testing and know that we can remove a large percentage of um, uh, malb taint as well. Um, so essentially anything that would, not anything per se, but most things that would bind up as a water molecule to a water molecule uh, because there's a steam release reaction uh, is evacuated through the flash. So we're getting a little bit of concentration of our bricks, um, intensified color because it's all released. And we're also getting, um, um, again, concentration, but we're getting all that stuff released and trapped elsewhere. Um, so we are working on a second project, which is um, just touch on quickly, which is a way to treat that condensate. So we're working with some, uh, some resins. It's a newer technology from, uh, from food processing. And we are working to treat that condensate and retrieve that natural grape water. And also, if we're successful, um, we are planning to harness the natural color um, that we get out of it. So... That's very exciting, um, but just in relation to the vintage variation with flash, which is the core reason why we think it's very much a part of the, the future picture in Canada as a whole, um, is that the technology is there to help us 
um, take out vintage swing. And it's not important for all types of wine. We realize that and, 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 and goals with um, looking at vintage variation, but on the middle tier to lower tier scale, um, especially we, we do notice that it's tough for us to have consistency in those, in those brands. And by using the flash as a tool, um, not as a, as a be all and end all answer for anything. Um, we, we strongly believe that we're going to be able to take a lot of the vintage curve out and, uh, and provide more consistency, especially as we see, um, climatic swings that are uh, unpredictable. That's very interesting. And then, and then lastly, Thierry talked really briefly about um, uh, stabiliz stabilization products. Uh, we are also looking at, um, with a very close eye, uh, allergen-free products through Vazon that are, are quite new. And they're all uh, based on inactive yeasts, but there, there's a core of them and they're very, very different in their own respect. Um, one being high in, high in glutathione, one being high in mannoproteins, um, which are, are the, the two main ones that we would uh, be working on a lot right now. And results are, are way, way more uh, concentrated and, and surprising than we thought. So uh, there's, there's really a future there in, in allergen-free products. And um, if anyone's interested in doing trials, uh, that's, that's where we... Um, that's where we find our happy place. So definitely come by the booth and um, and see if we can you know, discuss that further. Sorry to sorry to take so much time there. Oh, that's okay. That's, it's quite interesting. It's quite innovative. And um, thank you for uh, for your presentation, Thierry and um, and uh, David. I just had a quick question. Um, so uh, how small can the batches be? Because you said that you can. So is it like a uh, in liters, for example? This is for the flash. No, it's a little bit more than that, but it's so we've been able to do uh, as little as uh, one ton, uh, or even a bit less than that. But uh, it, it, of course, it's a lot of work, a lot of cleaning for for not much. So I would say a uh, reasonable uh, minimum would be uh, three tons, like one hour worth of working. Uh, yeah. But if if there are needs to do uh, some specific trials, we can do less than that. We actually some trials on apples, for instance, because it works also on apples. That could be interesting for cider. That's something we want to uh, explore uh, quite a bit. Um, and uh, yes, we've, we've done uh, uh, probably seven hundred kilograms of, uh, of apples. Right, right. Oh. So I have another question in um, the chat here. So will the flash remove other aromatic compounds and uh, precursors besides pyrazines? So very, very little, uh, fortunately. Uh, it looks like um, this. So what, what, what we've seen is that um, because we've been using it in uh, smoke tank removal, uh, or it's been used in smoke tank removal in uh, California, uh, Washington, and where uh, fires are a problem. Yes. And uh, the thing is, um, as far as the, the precursors are not uh, released, uh, it doesn't really go uh, with the with the, the steam. So. Uh, what we found, what we find in the in the steam um, on grapes, if we if we deal on grapes, of course, if we work on grapes, we'll find, as uh, David explained, mostly pyrazines and some uh, C6 uh, compounds, which will be uh, the ones that give the grassy and um, and and uh, hay uh, character. Um, some pyrazines, like the ones we get uh, with the uh, Asian uh, ladybug uh, problems; those are in in the condensate as well. So we can we can uh, remove them as well. Uh, but besides that, uh, the SO2, if if there is some SO2 added in the grapes, uh, a big part of that will be in the in the steam in the in the condensate. Uh, there's a tiny touch of color and maybe about eight uh, eight grams per liter of sugar and that goes. Uh, Away with that, with that uh, condensate, that can be later on treated and and uh, combined back or just uh, separated. 
If it's separated, in this case, we end up with a concentration of about seven, eight percent, which might be a good, a good thing sometimes, sometimes not. So we can decide what we want to do with the uh, with the condensate. Oh, okay. I'll just so, add, add add really quickly to that. Um, yes. That in, indeed we we are usually only doing a percentage of the grapes, and I've noticed no grape compound aromas coming over into the into the other side. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. which, which, uh, for sure is important. Um, we, yeah, we don't see, um, any of that, but to the sulfur compound uh, comment that Thierry made, um, we haven't done the testing, but being a winemaker for 10 years, working in vineyards, mm -hmm. um, the smell of cumulus and other products, um, um, uh, that have, uh, compounds like that tend to stick with you and we pick up we pick up lots of interesting smells <laughs> coming over. So um, that, that's a positive, I think, uh, to yeah. note. And, um, what, what the process is doing, I think it, that it's important to note is it's um, in fact liberating all the color that's in the grapes, but at the same time, because it's a quick heating, it's denaturing the oxidases and any botrytis as well. So that's important to note. Yeah. Um, so we don't have those oxidizable uh, uh, Precursors to oxidation present afterwards as well. So there's, there's lots, there's lots more to it, but those are just sort of the highlights. Okay. Well, thank you for all that information. So, um, I, I do have like uh, in your booth a little bit more details, probably about um, uh, your um, uh, in your processes, and uh, so. Uh, thank you, Thierry and David, and I will uh, direct the talk to um, Alisa and Darson from um, Taste Advisor. Um, and uh, Alisa and uh, Darson are here uh, to talk a little bit more about um, our uh, our app that we've been uh, using uh, that we launched just uh, earlier this year. Uh, Alisa is the the one who. Uh, actually uh, is behind, uh, like she has the vision, the strategy and the, uh, the growth uh, for, uh, for Taste Advisor. And uh, she comes from a background in, um, in uh, computative, uh, I mean, computational com computing um, uh, in the computer industry. So she'll, um, she'll talk to us a little bit more about uh, how we can use uh, the app uh, for our businesses. Thank you. Alisa? Thanks, Feely. You're welcome. Okay. <clears throat> can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. I'm gonna make yeah. sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Awesome. Well, I, um, I am really grateful for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you and uh, put up a presentation. And with me today, um, as Feely mentioned, is my colleague Darson. His camera's on if you're in the gallery view. Um, he's been a longtime team member with me and he's a sensory researcher. And so um, he's going to be able to speak to some of the questions that we that you might have later today. So, and my dog. <laughs> yes. So be prepared. Well, this is not a stage scenario. This is, this is an at-home scenario. Um, okay, so I'm going to share. Oh, can someone um, enable me as the host so I can share my screen? Um, um, Word, please. Oh. Go ahead now. You should be able to. Awesome. Perfect. Desktop to share. Okay, and... Let's just see. Okay, can everyone see the screen okay? Should see yes. a person. Okay, awesome, great. Um, just gonna... Well, I would like to um, personally thank Feely and Dort for the opportunity to share with you guys today. Um, at Taste Advisor, we're really grateful to be partners uh, with PEC and exploring the future of wine tourism together. Now, of course, no one has a crystal ball to predict what the future will look like. Um, this last year was a perfect example of un, you know, unforeseeable events that nobody could have predicted. But despite not being able to define exactly how the future of tourism will look like, we definitely can forecast some things um, and some essential elements that will be there. So to start us off, I'd like to define today what wine tourism is. 
So according to the United Nations Global uh, World Tourism Organization, NO tourism or wine tourism is tourism whose purpose is visiting vineyards, wineries, tastings, consuming and or purchasing wine at or near the source. And as I'm sure most of you know, wine tourism helps market the winery, establish long-term connections with, visit with visitors, and then ultimately leads to more cellar door sales. The longer a customer stays on the premise, the more wine they buy, which is why, interestingly, wine tourism is the fastest growing sector in the wine industry as a whole. In 2019, the uh, Ontario Wine and Grape Industry Performance Study showed that 90% of local wineries in your area indicated that tourism is essential to their business and has a key impact on sales. But wine tourism isn't just important to wineries. Uh, destination marketing organizations and associations like PECWA have also recognized the importance of unique local and regional attractions as a means of differentiating themselves from other travel destinations. They know that wine tourism provides a significant opportunity to revitalize and diversify tourism and promote local economic impact. In fact, wine tourism is such a big economic driver that it contributes to more than $9 billion in economic impact in Canada each year, which is a huge number. And when we work through all the way down from the province into your regional level, Prince Edward County Wine Growers Association is itself responsible for driving about roughly $13 million in meaningful economic impact to the county. That's a huge success. And it's one that as your partners, we want to see sustained and thriving for years to come. So um, uh, at Taste Advisor, we continually do research in what is driving wine tourism to be successful, how wine tourism is changing and where the future opportunities are. And I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of our research today. So first, I wanna look at the elements of wine tourism that are working. In addition to on-premise experiences, wine tourism is supported by these classic activities, having a regional brand like Pequa, um, having a regional website, having wine trails and signage, passport programs, uh, you wanna have education centers, tours and tourism partners, uh, obviously printed maps and brochures, wine events and competitions. And each of these activities are iconic of wine tourism. And they're iconic of wine tourism all over the world because they're all so successful. And so much so that they've been unaltered for decades. But around this success is an undercurrent of change that has been steadily reshaping the foundation of travel and tourism. And it's starting to penetrate the very traditional world of wine tourism. And that undercurrent is digitalization. Digitalization is when a business integrates technology into its operations so it can have new revenue and new value opportunities. It's no different than the change from landlines to cell phones. Technology is simply improving a process that we're all already familiar with. But the core function doesn't change. A phone is still a phone, but the capacity of that function or that core tool increases, which is why now we can take photos and search the internet and plan our trip to wine country from a device that once could only make a call. As we embrace digitalization, we get a couple key benefits, increased efficiency, better data, more insight, and of course, a boost to the top line. So with all these benefits, why is wine and wine tourism been slower than other industries to embrace digitalization? Well, we see two reasons for this. First, until the pandemic, wine tourism was thriving. So it's the old adage, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. The classic elements of wine tourism have been serving the industry with growing economic success for a long time. So there's been no obvious reason to make a change. The second reason though, is perhaps the true barrier to change and that's fragmentation. No one in the wine industry in our experience has said, no, I don't want a faster, more efficient way of doing things. They usually say, I don't have time and the change would be so much work and so much money. And if I translate this, what I hear is there are too many different priorities to manage and it's hard to choose, which makes sense because wine is not glamorous, it's hard work. Wineries are farmers and manufacturers and retailers and in hospitality. And the whole business model is expensive and heavily dependent on weather and regulations. It's not that we don't want to make change, it's that we have so many competing priorities and goals and only so much time, money and people to help. This is fragmentation. Now multiply that winery level fragmentation by 40 wineries in Prince Edward County and 
a thousand wineries in Canada and 10,000 plus wineries in the US. And you can see why a collective move towards digitalization is so challenging. But despite these challenges, digitalization is profoundly changing the way people live, work, travel, and do business. Even massively fragmented industries like music, film, and brick and mortar business have been upended by the innovation of digital technologies. For example, Spotify, they took music, which has millions of songs, artists, and genres, and found a way to not just make it mobile, centralized, and inexpensive, they made it personal so that their product actually recommends what you like. Netflix does this with movies and Amazon basically does this with everything else. So not only did these brands change their own business, they changed their industry because they changed the way consumers are consuming products, services, and experiences. Thanks to the innovation and prevalence of these leading digital brands, a growing number of consumers, including wine tourists, expect what we call the digital standard of service. And that's mobile access, curated search systems, and personalized recommendations. And mobile access speaks for itself of curated search systems and personalized recommendations. So search systems first. When it comes to experiencing a wine region, there are thousands of products and experiences and services to choose from in any region. But without some kind of curated database or search engine, consumers have to look at winery websites one by one and pour over each site carefully in order to make a decision of where they wanna go and what they wanna try. Well, the digital standard demands that wine regions provide some kind of curated database of their wineries, wines, and tourism experiences because consumers want to search quickly for relevant information about the area. In general, search engines just aren't enough. Consumers are expecting a niche marketplace dedicated to their specific interests. So an example of this trend taking hold in wine is how Wine Folly recently launched its regional guide for Walla Walla. This guide is a database and it's specific to Walla Walla with a list of their wineries and wines that gives consumers an accessible, generally comprehensive, relevant, free, and fast way to learn about the region. Wine Folly is planning to release other guides like this, illustrating how curated search systems are taking hold in the industry across North America. In addition to these search systems, digital practices and other industries have also created an expectation that information not just be fast, free, comprehensive, and relevant, which is a lot all on itself, but also come with personalized recommendations. Now, recommendations are something really common to the wine industry. With hundreds, if not thousands of wines in any one region, wineries and wine associations have understood that there needs to be some way for consumers to cut through the abundance of options and find something meaningful. This is why the industry has established things like wine critics or the 100 point wine scale or competitions or consumer ratings. All of these uh, are different types of recommendation systems that help a consumer have some way of finding something similar to their preference. Now I'll say these recommendation systems have worked for a long time and they still work today, but increasingly wine consumers want recommendations that are distinctly personal to them. Wine critic Eric Asimov of the New York Times recently suggested that it's time to rethink wine recommendations. And he says this, it's time to consider a better model that might be more useful to the consumer. The goal should be to give consumers the tools to educate themselves. The most valuable thing we can do is to help consumers develop confidence enough to think for themselves. Almost everyone agrees that wine is intimidating and makes people a little bit anxious. By making it seem less arcane, the thinking goes, consumers will be more likely to embrace wine as a pleasure rather than shun it as a burden. Consumers are not liberated by wine reviews. Instead, they are bound to the reviewers dependent on the direction of the critical thumb. In other words, his quote says, it's time to rethink how recommendations are done. Wine can be a little bit intimidating and stressful and personal recommendations can help. So what is a recommendation system and what type of system is needed to properly recommend wines, considering that wine is so unique to personal taste? Well, I'll walk you through a couple of things. First, a recommendation system is simply a way to use a lot of data to predict if something would be useful to someone. 
Vivino, as an example, uses recommendations all the time to help their consumers find the right wine. They collect like millions of um, data points from user ratings, and then they apply a collaborative filtering model to predict similar products the consumer will like. Now, this recommendation system that they use does help filter through the millions of wines in Vivino, which is a big task in itself, but it also takes a lot of data before it can even start to recommend anything. And the recommendations are still based on crowdsource ratings, uh, which are dramatic, very dramatically between users. And see, wine is the sensory experience, which means it engages all five senses. And that's why understanding how consumers use wine attributes to develop their taste preference is really important to being able to make personalized recommendations. It's not just about ratings, um, it's about translating this information. So typically wine is described in attributes like uh, terms like it's alcohol, acidity, tannins, body, sweetness, and flavor, and so on. But consumers don't use terms like this to describe their preferences. They use more binary language like I like this or I don't like this. So at Taste Advisor, we take a sensory approach and we try to help bridge the gap between the industry jargon, those attribute terms and consumer preference. And so that all so that wines can be recommended at an individual level. So over the last couple of years, my team and I at Taste Advisor have conducted numerous sensory evaluation studies to determine which attributes are driving consumer preference around wine. Through these laboratory studies, focus groups, online surveys, and interviews, we have really come to appreciate how personalized the sensory experience of wine can be and the nuance required to match an individual with a wine they are really likely to enjoy. Research like ours forms the foundation for an attribute or knowledge-based recommendation system. So unlike Vivino's crowdsource recommendations, knowledge-based recommendations match a user's preference to products that specifically have the attributes that the, the user is looking for. So not only is this more accurate, um, and dependable, it also uh, recommends wines without needing as much input or as much data. Um, so even Vivino, they're getting on board with this approach to personal recommendations. They just recently raised $155 million just to build a new type of wine recommendation system like this. So Vivino's move and Wine Folly are both really good examples of how the digital standard is gaining momentum in the wine industry. Now, with recommendations on the rise and clearly very valuable, what are the benefits to wine tourism? Well, here are some interesting stats. Recommend, re recommendation systems result in products being selected twice as often as if they weren't recommended, a competitive advantage over other regions, results that are statistically more accurate than human experts, and equitable results. This last point about equity, I think is specifically relevant to regions um, like Prince Edward County. Equity means that all brands have the same opportunity. If a consumer indicates that they like a tropical light bodied white wine, as an example, and you make that, your wine will be recommended just as highly and just as frequently as any other wine with that sensory profile, which basically means that digital recommendations don't play favorites. So why is it important overall to embrace this digital standard of service? I think this quote by Corinna Underwood an artificial intelligence researcher says it perfectly. Um, as more and more products become available online, recommendations and search engines are crucial to the future, not only because they help increase customer sales and interactions, but because they will continue to help wine regions and wineries supply customers with products they really like. In fact, according to the World Economic Forum's Digital Transformation Initiative, by 2025, digitalization and this digital standard um, in aviation, travel, and tourism are expected to create up to $305 billion um, in value for this industry, which represents a big opportunity for Prince Edward County. So we wanna look at how Prince Edward County can rise to the digital standard and take advantage of this abundance to come. We've broken this down into two categories. One, there's the winery level. Um, things that wineries can do to embrace the digital standard are to have a mobily responsive website, add e-commerce um, or an online wine shop if you don't already have one, implement a digital booking system, 
maybe consider um, introducing personalization or customization to your wine club packages with some sort of digital interface to do that. Um, you could look at exploring digital experiences like Zoom wine tastings, virtual vineyard tours, or a 3D, uh, 3D wine shop. And uh, Jeff Summers mentioned earlier the reality, the virtual reality labor, labels or the augmented reality. Those are all perfect examples of digitalization at a winery level. Then at the wine region level, um, some basic things that can happen is at minimum, it's great if a wine region adds dynamic search filters to their website. But ideally, you know, uh, they, the industry or the region works towards some kind of central database of their wines and um, their experiences in an area. And something more like a, a more robust, more dynamic uh, digital version of a, of a wine map. And all of these suggestions are gonna help make your region more relevant, comprehensive, accessible, and personal for your consumers. Uh, and so, uh, thanks to the innovative mindset of Dwart and the PECWA board, Prince Edward County, like Feely mentioned earlier, is already taking big steps in this direction. In March, you guys launched your first curated search system with personal recommendations called the PEC Wine Explorer. And in your first month, during the winter and a lockdown, your Explorer gained over 500 users, you saw 8,000 active sessions, and 19,000 interactions with 1,000 detailed wine reviews. This is some pretty significant momentum, and you guys are just getting started. And I just want to put this in perspective that PECWA's decision to move um, towards this digital standard and, and embracing digitalization is something that not even North America's largest wine regions are embracing. They, they don't have a platform like this. They haven't moved in this direction. You guys are really leading the way in this personalized approach to wine tourism. And we just want to say congratulations and thank you for having us here today. So we'd like to use the rest of our time just to ask uh, to hear any questions that you guys have about the new platform, about this bigger philosophy around digitalization, um, and speak to um, speak to any of your questions. Anybody has questions? Just Dwart has a comment that uh, if you haven't grabbed the the app, uh, please head to the website. He has the the website uh, posted uh, right in the chat. So please uh, feel free. I mean, it is a free uh, app, so just please uh, feel free to download it. Um, one, I had a question regarding um, the, the way the, um, the algorithm works, I guess. Mm -hmm. so because it's uh, all based on a personalized, a personal taste. That means mm -hmm. that uh, regardless of what the label is like, the ratings are, mm -hmm. the reviews, and the price, the if the wine matches your taste, it's it's gonna be. I mean, they're gonna be put on the same line. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that that's our comment about equity, and that you know, um, majority, like vast majority of wineries in any given region are you know or relatively small producers, which means that, you know, they're out in the vineyard, they're, you know, heavily burdened down by manufacturing. And there isn't as much time, you know, people or budget necessarily, like some of the larger brands to get out there and, you know, uh, pick from the top labels or really, you know, work closely with a great marketing organization to, to distinguish themselves in that same way. And, and while that marketing element is very important, um, at the end of the day, it really comes down to whether someone likes that wine or not. And sometimes the, you know, a great label, um, you know, when people buy by the label, which happens all the time, uh, you know, it, it's not ideal because sometimes the label looks great and that wine just doesn't fit their profile. And it's not that it's not a great wine. And so by making sure that if we know what attributes that wine has and we know what attributes this person typically likes, it just disqualifies any of those other, you know, value indicators and gets right down to the merits of the bottle. One thing just to quickly add uh, to what Alyssa said is it's really about making wine more accessible and less intimidating like she was saying in the presentation. So that's why we've developed a really short taste test that's uh, integrated into the app. So when you download it or go to the web version, you'll see it but it's designed to be really short and not intimidating. So even someone with little or no experience with wine can take it. And uh, based on years now of doing sensory evaluation research, we've been able to develop an algorithm that can take the results of that short, easy to take taste test 
and pr produce these percent this percent match for every wine in the database. So it really is about making wine and finding the wine that you like the most more accessible and less intimidating. And I'm I'll uh, go ahead, go ahead, Derek. <laughs> so when you did that, uh, you go ahead, Elisa, because I just have like a comment and a question. I have so a, Okay, well, I just wanted to comment on, on how um, one of the areas, like I mentioned earlier, that we're so familiar with this is, is with something like Spotify, right? So you've got so many different types of songs and, you know, I kind of like music, you know, you know, you can say like, I sort of like country, you know, but you couldn't say an artist and you couldn't say what style and I definitely couldn't, uh, you know, and then I go into something like Spotify and I start listening and then I can, all of a sudden I've discovered, you know, artists who would never have gotten my attention just because their algorithm feeds them in because they know it, it matches what I like. And in the same way, you know, you're gonna have wineries or even a wine within your winery that maybe gets overlooked because it's a, a more rare varietal or, you know, it's just rarer to the county. And all of a sudden it's gonna get recommended because that's somebody likes that kind of thing. They couldn't have told you they liked that rare varietal, but they ended up liking all of the sensory elements of it. And, um, and that's why we think it's just so important. Mm -hmm. So when you did your survey, like how many uh, regions did you actually look at? In terms of the wine, like the sensory yes. components themselves. Yeah. So yeah. we did sensory research. Um, we've done our, our sample base in the beginning. We had about a thousand people on the platform doing samples with us and they were from all over. We had about 300 of those in Ontario and and about 700, well, I would say about five in BC and 200 in Alberta. So we, we, you know, invited anybody in and they could take the taste test and see what would get recommended from, the, you know, the sample base was in British Columbia uh, in terms of the products, um, but mm -hmm. the actual users um, tasting it were from all over Canada. So was it like a blind test or was it just uh, like in, what kind in, of... So we actually produced the algorithm, digitalized it. So initially what we did is we um, ran our first draft of what we thought the algorithm should include. And then we actually did like, you know, wine tastings and, you know, broke them out to qualify it properly with about 50 people to make sure our attributes were accurate or, or suggesting. And then, um, and then we digitalized it and put it out to thousands of people and said, okay, here we've got 5,000 wines. Um, and we've got, you know, a couple thousand of those with completed profiles. We, we know all there is to know about it. And, mm -hmm. um, and we had a thousand people go in and, and take the test and, and then they rated wines as they were trying them. And mm -hmm. then we could see the accuracy between the wine that they tried and what they said mm -hmm. they liked. So, yeah, you know, I was just going to say, we've also, you know, we've done in-person taste tests and focus groups, and we've done all sorts of different uh, types of sensory evaluation methods to refine the algorithm to, to improve it over time. So, so, um, so there's been multi-method approach over um, lots of different, different techniques and, and, and um, di different sample sizes. So, so we've been doing this for, for a number of years now to, to kind of refine it to get to where it is and able to, to recommend a wine with over 91% accuracy uh, at this point. So based on all of this research. So, um, yeah. but I do get your, there certainly is a cultural component as, as uh, Alyssa said, to, to taste and flavor and, and we've certainly taking that into account. Mm -hmm. So yeah. are you planning on expanding to uh, another country or? Like yeah, actually we maybe? have clients in um, the States. And so obviously expanding to our closest neighbor is really important. Um, but generally we're working towards uh, first world wine countries. So um, for those who maybe don't know in the audience, but um, the, the Prince Edward County uh, Wine Explorer is, is a, a white label platform. So we work with multitude of wine regions um, and they can personalize the platform. It has all their own unique content, but we create some economies of scale by having something that multiple people can use. And that's partly what makes it accessible in terms of price and in effort. Um, and so we found that culturally, the way that people taste wine and, and more importantly, tour in wine regions is, is consistent if you stay in New World Wine, which would be Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, the United States, Canada, right? Uh, we kind of do things a certain way and um, as compared to Europe, which has quite a different philosophy to tourism in general. Thanks. And I just want, I want to say, so, I mean, as we've seen today already um, we're very lucky to partner and work with a lot of uh, innovative sort of cutting edge 
um, partners, whether that be printing or uh, wine production or um, you know, uh, service uh, providers. We were really lucky to find Wine Explorer, um, a Canadian solution. Um, right. You look at you look at things like Vivino, um, and there's a lot of U.S. tools or other things, um, but you can't find any Canadian wine content on those platforms, mm -hmm. especially for a very small region like Prince Edward County, where majority of the wines are not available in the LCBO. Um, so for consumers to discover that, um, especially in the year where we haven't had tourism, people haven't been able to visit us. How do you discover um, a wine region that you may be not totally familiar with or haven't visited yet? Um, and obviously, um, COVID has sort of spurred that digital um, innovation. Yeah. I think wine is still one of those last uh, yeah. things. We Legging. Did. Because it is a sensory product, right? Yeah. You're not selling a widget like Amazon is. So how do you... Yes. How do you get that? And I should mention that um, just a wine app would be very niche for the for the wine nerds, and that our PC Wine Explorer is not just a wine app; it's a full tourism um, app. Um, so it's wine, and then all our tourism partners as well. So that just leads me to my question, Lisa: Is how can um, you know wineries? sort of leverage the app um, in terms of sales and marketing um, of their wines um, mm -hmm. and in terms of highlighting it sort of um, in the app uh, based on the algorithm. Yeah, so there's a couple basic things. First, you know, uh, Pequa is doing all of this work to create some collective uh, momentum and traffic. And there's no reason to miss out on that. So yeah, you can have a profile in the platform and we make sure that your wines are updated. But you know, sometimes the some of your attributes, like maybe the body of a wine isn't listed anywhere that we can see. So it's really great. First step is log in, make sure that you've added the attributes, um, the sensory attributes about the wine and that it'll say that the wine is now complete. It's got a completed profile. And we need a completed profile to recommend because we don't do like, well, if you only gave us three of the 10 variables we need and, and, you know, this person likes those three, then it's great. Let's recommend it. We don't do that because that's what, what could happen is, for example, it could be a berry cherry wine and, in terms of flavor, and it could be um, not very sweet, which is what I prefer. But then if you gave me a really light bodied version of that, I'd be like, oh, it's still not a good fit <laughs> because body really matters to me. Right. So yeah. we make sure we only recommend when it's a hundred percent, we know we have all the attributes and we know the, all the, uh, all the preferences. And so the best thing you can do is quickly go in and add those attributes. Most of you have them, they're in your tech sheets, your winemaker knows them. It's like twice a year, spring release, fall release. It, the whole thing should take maybe 10 minutes. So it's meant to be really easy. And then like we talked about the algorithm will just start putting, you know, when it'll go in and say red wines for you. And it'll show me as an individual taster, which red wines are best match for me in that order. So you could be a tiny little producer with like 200 cases of something and it'll show up as like, Hey, that's the right price point. That's a, that's a red. I'm really going to like, like, for example, Dwart and I were talking during our demo in early days. And I'm actually from Prince Edward County from Rednersville originally. So I know the County and I, you know, I know some of the wines and, um, and typically you're not known for as big, bold reds, you know, but still when I went through and you've got hundreds and hundreds of wines there, there were a handful of wineries that had a more full body red. And I was like, those are the ones I'm going to, <laughs> like, that's for me. And, and it's a perfect example. I might've gone to wineries with only light bodied, you know, uh, white wines or uh, that maybe aren't my fit. Um, so that's a way that you can, you can capture the traffic that Prince Edward County is driving into the platform and make sure that your wines are there and, and are visible. So adding those attributes. The other really cool thing you can do is that you can encourage consumers at, from a tasting per experience and say, hey, have, you know, do you have the, the PEC Wine Explorer app? And in the beginning, half your you know, tasters are gonna come in and go, no, I've never heard of that because it's new. And um, you can encourage them to download it. They can take the taste test. And then even the wines in your tasting room are gonna be sorted from the best match. So if somebody only has two or three wines that they are going to try in your flight, why not encourage them to try the two or three that they're most likely to enjoy? And, and the best way to know that is to use the app. 
plus it's fun. People are like, oh, cool. I can rate this wine and, you know, oh, this is a good match for me. Like it's a very engaging um, experience, but it does give you more insight than you would ever have about what that person's going to like. Thanks for that. Uh, there's a question. In, there's a yes. question in the chat. Um, when listing wine attributes, I'm always confused by whether to say for my 2018 Pinot Noir, whether I should consider it to be a lighter red with low tannin compared to a Cab Sauv, or whether I should consider that for a Pinot Noir, it's medium to full bodied with medium tannin. So I, I would go, um, so we use international scales for all of these things. You know, there's an international sugar scale, there, you know, residual sugar and body tan and tannins are both on just a five point scale, one to five. And so that's, meant, that's supposed to be representative of all wines when you think of one to five. Um, and, and so I would suggest sticking with the light bodied, even though it might be medium for a Pinot, it's still generally light. Yep. But that said, we have, it says five point scale. So if you have a real light bodied wine, make it one. And if it's slightly heavier, make it a two, but it's not a medium. It's always good to think of it from a consumer perspective. So it might, it might be fuller bodied for a Pinot Noir, but is it a, but what would the typical consumer think uh, when they're thinking of a red wine? That's a great question. Uh, yeah, it was. Oh, cool. Uh, thanks, Jeff. I, we appreciate uh, yeah. hearing that uh, for sure. Yes, thank you, Jeff. And, I, and are there any other questions or? Well, I was just gonna say this is a loaded question because I know what the uh, <laughs> answer is. Um, but if, if for this captured audience, if you want to tell us uh, what new features are coming yes. uh, down yeah. the pipeline for uh, well, you want to explore? So one of the advantages um, that we try to bring to our regions we work with is uh, constantly having new features. And normally, like if if a region goes out on their own and let's say you know Pequa had decided we're going to build an app from scratch, not only would it have been really expensive and probably more complicated, but then every year you'd have to think about do we want to add new things? Can we afford to do that? And we just make sure that that can happen. Um, so this year's new features is that we're going to be adding a, a map section to the app so that you can filter by different types of organizations, taking that sort of paper map concept and making it so much more dynamic. You can live see profiles, click through to the website. So the map is gonna be really nice way to orient yourself to the county. Um, and we're also gonna be able to have uh, what we call email digest, but really it's simply a way, oh, stop. Um, it's simply a way for um, you to be able to bring the best wines to the attention of people who visited your region. And so perfect example of that is we have um, a list. If you've completed the taste, uh, the taste test, you'll get a weekly top 10 wines. And that changes every week. And you can set up an email now that'll send it out to somebody and say, hey, if you're interested, we can send you the short list of your top 10 so you don't forget. You don't forget about us. So if you're going to LCBO and you want to find something new to try, it's right there, right in front of you. And so this kind of added engagement is just going to further the relationships that you have with the people who've chosen um, to enjoy PEC. So those are some of the core, the core elements. And everything else is very like technical on the back end, like, oh, this needs to happen to make that better and make you know this group happier, that kind of thing. But those are the user features. So cool. Well, thank you, Elisa. I mean, uh, it's so informative. You're just perfect. Uh, um, thank you. I think that um, everyone, nobody else has any questions for now. So thank you again to all the speakers in this uh, session. And uh, thank you, Elisa, for joining us for all the way from BC and thank Arsene you. from Alberta. So um, take care and uh, see you soon. Great. Have a great Thank day, you, everyone. everyone. Enjoy the rest of the yeah. conference. And uh, we'll see you in a little bit. We can head out to the, um, the meetups uh, that are scheduled with uh, all the session sponsors uh, for these the, the two afternoon sessions. And uh, we'll also uh, have, uh, in a bit, uh, we'll have uh, Nancy Stone Lake uh, right after the break, so at uh, 3.10. Okay? Thank you.